You know, our panel is titled, Is There a Better Way to Appoint Federal Judges? Uh, I'm honored to be here today with uh, four very distinguished and very knowledgeable uh, scholars in this area, and I'm pretty much going to just try to stay out of the way. We're going to have a format where I'll briefly introduce them, but I'll refer you to the bios and the materials to really get an in-depth idea of their expertise, which I don't have time to do uh, justice to. I'm then going to ask each of the um, panelists a question, and then we're going to have a dialogue for about an hour, and maybe a little bit short of an hour, I'll try to get a, from a show of hands if, how many questions you have. If there are no questions, we'll continue for a bit more, and if not, um, we'll uh, stop and try to leave some time for questions. <clears throat> uh, on the panel with me today, for my, uh, I'm not going to try to do this in order because it's not, we're not seated in the order on my iPad. My, my iPad rules my life, so. Uh, James Lindgren, Professor of Law from Northwestern University School of Law, who is on my right, far right. Professor Alfreda Robinson, who's on my immediate right, is the Associate Dean for Trial Advocacy and Professorial Lecturer in Law and Co-Director of the Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program at George Washington University School of Law. Uh, Russell Wheeler, on my left, is a visiting fellow of Governance Studies Program in the Brookings Institution, also President of the Governance Institute and an adjunct professor at the American University College of Law. And on my um, far left is Ryan Scott, an associate professor of law at the Mower School of Law at Indiana University. And I'd like to um, begin by asking my first question of Professor um, Wheeler, and that is, can you provide us with an overview, just to get us started, of the various stages of the appointment process, the players, the institutions involved, and the current landscapes and vacancies, so we have a kind of a basic threshold to, to have our discussion about the appointment process. Yeah, thank you, Judge. Um, <clears throat> I, I suspect most of you know the players uh, in the selection process. It's important to keep in mind that very little of this is regulated by statute or law. It's, it's regulated by a lot of very strong and formal traditions. But you know, basically, a, a vacancy occurs. Um, the White House and the Justice Department, along with home state senators and others, uh, search for nominees, uh, receive applications in some cases, submit the nomination to the to the Senate uh, after the FBI has investigated the pr prospective candidates, as well as the American Bar Association's Committee on the Federal Judiciary, and then it goes to the Senate where if the nominee has the support of home state senators, the chances are pretty good the nominee will get a hearing, and if the nominee gets a hearing, the chances are pretty good the nominee will get reported out and sent to the floor of the Senate. Uh, the dynamic has changed somewhat, and we'll talk more about how it's changed because uh, last November the Senate changed the rules, making it easier for a majority of senators to end debate on nominations. Uh, a majority rather than a three-fifths majority is, is now all it takes, and we can talk about what impact, if any, that has had on the process. I, I, I prepared um, a, a handout which, uh, just to, just to kind of anchor, try to anchor this uh, debate in, in, in some facts. I realize these numbers are, are uh, if you follow this, the, the numbers are just banded about all over the place. I used to go to meetings of the Judicial Conference and the chair of the Judiciary Committee would come in and describe the state of judicial nominations and he would leave and then the ranking member would come in and describe the state of judicial nominations and I, I had to conclude there were actually two Senates because these two people couldn't be talking about the same thing. Uh, but, if, but if we look at this, just follow me through this uh, chart. What is the current situation? Well, as of now, uh, the president has submitted, it's 307, not 305 uh, nominations, uh, all told, has uh, gotten 264 confirmations for an 86% confirmation rate, which frankly stacks up fairly well with his immediate predecessors. Um, there are currently 61 vacancies. I've noted the time it takes not only from the vacancy to the nomination, but also from the nomination to the confirmation. Now, th those are the figures. You say compared to what? Um, I'm not going to poach on your territory, but it, I, it's interesting. During the Johnson and Nixon presidencies, two of the very tumultuous presidencies in the last century, uh, the uh, time from nomination to confirmation for Nixon and Johnson's district and appellate nominees ranged between 17 days and 37 days and their confirmation rates never dipped below 91% median for the Nixon and Johnson district and circuit. So 
we live in a, in a totally different world now, and, and there's only so much we can talk about fixes to the process that's going to change some of that. What I have done is compared the current state of nominations and confirmations with where it stood eight years ago in the Bush administration. And you can see, although there was a lot of hand wringing in the early part of the Obama administration about the slow pace of nominations and the slow pace of confirmations, Obama has now uh, submitted more nominations than did President Bush at this time, and the Senate has confirmed more, uh, more nominees uh, than uh, at, at at this point in President Bush's presidency, and you can see that the confirmation rates are roughly the same. Um, Bush did very well as far as district judges go, not quite so well as far as, as circuit judges go. And you can see on the, on the two uh, temporal measures, it took the Bush administration less time to get the nominations in place and uh, less time to get confirmations, although those figures, these are median figures, and a lot of Bush circuit nominees waited a real long time uh, over the course of three or four years sometimes from their first nomination to get confirmed. Now, uh, you can ask the question, well, what has to happen if at the end of eight years, President Obama will, will just say, will have had the same number of confirmations as President Bush? By the end of his term, President Bush had appointed 321 judges to the courts, uh, courts of appeals and the district courts. And you can see by this, this uh, third uh, table here uh, that at the end of, um, uh, at the end of five years, uh, Bush had, had, had appointed 223 judges, Obama just 214. But then at the start of the sixth year, the Senate really went on a, on a blitzkrieg and uh, began confirming judges at a very, uh, comparatively very rapid pace. So from the 1st of January 2006 to this point in 2006, the Senate confirmed 20 Bush nominees, it confirmed 50 of uh, Obama nominees. Um, and you get the same figures that were on the earlier table. And then Bush was able to get another 78 judges confirmed by the end of his term for that total of 321. Uh, for Obama to match that, he needs to get 57 more confirmations. We'll get four more on Tuesday, evidently. But what's interesting, if you'll note on the next to the last line under Bush, uh, of Bush's 78 confirmations that came between this point and the end of his presidency, 68 occurred in 2007, 2008, when the Senate was under Democratic control. Mm -hmm. So the question we're wondering about is, if the Senate goes Republican uh, after the November elections, will the Republican Senate confirm a proportionate number of Obama nominees? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anybody does. I, I must say I'm not holding my breath. Now, a lot of people have asked, what's been the effect of this change in the cloture rule? Is it, the, is it responsible for this uh, rapid increase in the number <coughs> of confirmations? Well, I don't think anybody can say for sure, but in this next table, what I've done is, is indicated the number of confirmations by year and the number of confirmations that got at least 38 no votes, 38 being a fairly good guess of the number of votes you'd need to defeat a cloture motion in the Senate. There's no set figure. If, there's, if all senators vote, you need 40 votes to defeat it. If fewer votes, you need proportionally fewer. So I picked 38. And, you can, and, and, and then we can say, let's assume that the 38 who voted against the nomination would have voted for, uh, against cloture. In other words, would have sustained the filibuster. Now, those are not very strong assumptions, but just indulge me for a second. Uh, we can see that uh, in this period of, 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 since the cloture rule was changed, four district judges um, got confirmed with 38 or more negative votes, and six circuit judges got confirmed with 38 or more uh, negative votes. Now, if we could take those as an indication that if the rules hadn't changed, those individuals would have been filibustered and the nominations withdrawn, you see at the bottom how that would have affected uh, Obama's uh, confirmation rate. He, instead of uh, 215 confirmations of district judges, he had 211. Instead of 49 circuit confirmations, he would have had 43 uh, for a total confirmation of 254 as opposed to the uh, 264. But I stress, we cannot assume that be, because a senator votes against a nominee that the senator necessarily would have voted uh, against the cloture, would have voted to maintain a filibuster. Because you can see in the years from 2009 to 2000, uh, up, up until the, 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 the change, 
eight district judges got confirmed, even though 38 senators or more voted against them. Um, and uh, it's a little different on the, on the, on the uh, appellate side. But I think, we can, I think we can say, we're just stargazing here, I think we can say that probably those four district judges would have been confirmed, probably wouldn't have been filibustered. Can't say that about the circuit judges who've been confirmed since then. We know that three would have been filibustered because they were filibustered. They were the three nominees to the Court of Appeals here in Washington. And the filibuster of those three, as a matter of fact, seems to have been the straw that broke the camel's back and led Harry Reid to invoke the so-called nuclear option. The other three who got confirmed with 38 or more negative votes were one, David Barron in the First Circuit, who became, got in Rand Paul's uh, rifle scope. And uh, I think he got 44 or 45 negative votes. And then two nominees from uh, California, uh, one of whom had the temerity to defend uh, opponents of Proposition 8, and the other of whom was nominated to a seat whose, whose state was in dispute, whether it was a California or a Montana state. So the, the filibuster change had some effect, but it is not by any means solely responsible for this big upsurge in confirmations. Uh, one other question that comes up, and that is the effect of the so-called blue slip. So on the other side of the sheet, um, if, if you followed this, you, you, the, the, the tradition is the, Sen the Senate Judiciary Chair sends out a, a, a slip, and it's, as a matter of fact, it's blue, and it, uh, to the home state senators and says, uh, please return this, uh, this uh, notice uh, indicating your support of the nominee from your state. And if the blue slip doesn't come back, or even if it comes back and then the senator changes his or her mind, this, the Judiciary Committee will not process the nomination. So it's in the White House interest. It's, it's essential for the White House to get a, a okay from both home state senators, because if they're lacking that, there's no point in making the nomination. And we can see now uh, there's a dispute about a nominee in Georgia who has got the Georgia Democrats and the civil rights community quite up in arms. Uh, he was nominated under this arrangement, and the White House said we had no choice. Whether that nomination goes forward, I don't know. Uh, last Thursday, the President nominated two judges to vacancies in Western Kentucky, one of whom is an avowed supporter of Rand Paul. Whether or not that nomination is going to go very far or not, I don't know. It may, it may engender the same kind of opposition. But what you see from this chart is, for those vacancies in the District and Court of Appeals that have no nominee, and that were either created or announced more than six months ago, they give the process some time to work, those nominee vacancies are overwhelmingly in states with at least one Republican senator. The, the collective percentages are 85 percent. And it takes longer to get them up there. Of those, of those 29 vacancies, 11 are in Texas, uh, five are in Pennsylvania, it was nine until last week, uh, three in Alabama, two in Kentucky. Um, and then you see there's five vacancies in states with Democratic senators. But this is not a new phenomenon either. At this point in the Bush, Bush presidency, if you look down uh, to the next chart, you'll see that um, once you take away nominees who have no senators here in the District of Columbia, 68% um, uh, uh, 60, are in states with two Democratic senators. And these were primarily in Michigan where there was a longstanding fight about vacancies throughout the Sixth Circuit, and four from California, where there was fighting between the Democratic senator and the, uh, the vetting committee that was appointed by the Republican Party out there. So it, it appears maybe the blue slip veto, we want to call it, is being exercised a little more vigorously than it was, but it's nothing that just came on the scene once Obama became president and the Republican senators decided to start <coughs> using it a little more, uh, uh, a little more effectively. And there's a lot of talk about whether or not the, this blue slip veto should be eliminated, and there's pressure on Senator Leahy to do so. He insists that the blue slip isn't the problem. There's, there's a notion of, of, of patronage in the Senate, and senators are not going to want to vote against uh, vote for nominees who don't have the support of a home state senator because they want the same privilege for themselves. Finally, um, there's been in the news also about the change in the composition of the Court of Appeals. So what this last table shows is the <clears throat> breakdown of active judges on the court, uh, that's those who, have, who, who are in active status on the judges of the Court of Appeals when Obama took office and uh, today. And there's been a, a change. Uh, when Obama took office, uh, uh, all but one of the Courts of Appeals 
were either split evenly or had a, Republic, a, 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 a majority of Republican appointees. Now, nine of the Court of Appeals have majorities of Democratic appointees among their active judges. And you can see down here, the breakdown among active judges nationwide when he took office was 60% Republican appointees, 40% Democratic appointees. Now it's 46% Republican appointees and 54% uh, Democratic appointees. But as Judge McKee will tell you, that is by no means a surefire prediction of how of the decisional tendencies of the courts of appeals, um, because the, 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 any three-judge panel is not necessarily going to reflect this breakdown. And also, senior judges participate. Sen they don't participate at the same rate as do district as do active judges, but nevertheless, senior judges in the court of appeals, not surprisingly, are um, have a strong majority of Republican appointees. But this does indicate that slowly Obama is putting his imprint on the Court of Appeals, but it's not as if the whole thing has changed radically. It's changed rather incrementally. Uh, I'll stop there, and uh, if I can later answer any questions you have or my colleagues have, I'll be glad to try to do so. Professor, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Robinson, you have kind of a, a I won't say unique, but uh, a, certainly a very good relationship with some folks in the White House, and I don't want you to say anything which is going to breach any confidences. Um, but can you take us behind the scenes a little bit and let us know what goes on behind closed doors to the extent you can, either when a nomination goes over or when someone is trying to lobby for candidate X or candidate Y? I'll be glad to do so. Let me uh, indicate that uh, my experience is based on, <clears throat> for a number of years, uh, longer than I'd like to remember, uh, of serving as the National Bar Association's chair of uh, the Standing Committee of Judicial Selection. So we have something of a unique role in the process, and it's not just with the current administration. Uh, we also uh, had that relationship and went behind the scenes in Bush II White House. Uh, m much is made of the nomination and then, but most particularly confirmation process. Uh, but it, it really starts before that. There is a, an agreement uh, uh, that all of the parties and players um, have, have come to, which is at first, uh, it should be a collaborative effort. I don't mean it doesn't look like sausage making, or worse, <laughs> and many times, uh, but it's supposed to be collaborative. The other agreement is it, that everyone has sort of um, collaborated, if you will, around, that the goal is to fill every vacancy. Uh, the courts, when they're not at full capacity, uh, tends to get sluggish, and we need a full capacity, roaring on four engines, judicial branch. Everyone agrees on that. But what happens in the practice, in, in the behind the scenes, is that those ag that consensus breaks down. Those agreements are honored more in the breach than in, in, in the observance. Uh, it is uh, amazing to me that we actually get through the process in the current climate, which of course is different since we've developed social media, since um, uh, there's, there's really been a hard edge that is on both sides uh, of, of uh, every issue, not just judicial nominations, uh, and uh, people have really dug in politically. I think part of it is that we have things like this, which are tapes that many, you know, uh, are concerned about. But behind the scenes, it really begins before there's an announced nomination. Uh, a judge might, as, as, as the chief judge knows, might indicate to a friend or other judges on a particular court, I'm thinking about retiring in a couple of years. Or they might directly speak to the White House and say, I'm thinking about retiring, or I need to retire, or speak to their own home senator. At that point, everyone begins the process of trying to identify a persons, if you will, plural, who would be good for the court. Behind the scenes, the bar associations weigh in, we, 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 we call it lists, present lists to the senators and to the White House of those who are extraordinary in uh, the bar community. Uh, judges are asked for recommendations. They know a lot of lawyers. They know a lot of lower, lower court 
and state judges, uh, and I think that is that is um, uh, not, in my judgment, bad for the process. Uh, and then others uh, in groups such as the um, National Bar Association and others, even though they say they don't um, make sort of push anyone in the nominations process, do not believe it. <laughs> So that that becomes sort of the rich ground where we begin. And then those names are vetted. They're vetted by all the groups, uh, not just the American Bar Association, which formally has, has a formal relationship for vetting with the White House. Bush, of course, Bush too refused to do it. Uh, he thought that the judges that were um, rated highest by the American Bar Association were on uh, the liberal side, he, he wanted anyone who wanted to be a judge to have the opportunity to come directly to the White House. Uh, and then you have you know others who sort of begin, and the senators themselves, particularly uh, a senator uh, that is in the same party as the occupant of the White House. They begin a very rich and ongoing conversation about who should be on the list for um, likely candidates for a vacant seat, whether it's immediate or whether it's in the future. Uh, behind the scenes, everyone begins to try to come up with, if depending on whether you're conservative, uh, progressive, whatever you want to call it, everyone tries to, in their particular niche, begin to agree upon a shorter list of folks who ought to be in the mix. And uh, that happens in all the ways that it can happen. There are um, groups, uh, and I'm part of many of them, if you're really in this, what we call the space of judicial nominations, you are working on judicial nominations every single day. Uh, you would, might receive uh, in, in any, during in, you know, any 24 hour period, you might have as few as 25 emails uh, you're probably going to have much more than that. And there are about nominations all over the country. Uh, academics are asked for recommendations. Who, who is doing some great work on the bench already? Who seems like a likely candidate? Maybe in the academy, maybe in business, or just on the bench. Uh, the president leaned, the current president leans very heavily, if, if you look at the uh, the nomination sort of list, not who made the ultimately was nominated, uh, really was looking for judges, people who already had some judicial experience, and looking clearly to diversify the bench in all kinds of ways, not just, you know, what people think he was thinking, but in all kinds of ways. And if you look at the record, that push towards diversity he has accomplished. Uh, Bush, too, uh, and others, and Reagan, and so on, had a particular goal in mind for those who would sit on the bench. Because what happens is if, you're in the, if you are in a lifetime appointment uh, and, and you're a president, why not put your footprint there? That's the most lasting. Legislation, most legislation is not as lasting as a, a judge who sits there for 30 years. So most want to have judges that can do a 20, 30 year, 30 year uh, period on the bench, correct? Whether they start a district court of appeals or have their eye on something, uh, to, uh, the Supremes as we call them, but you still want sort of longevity. Uh, as this nomination process is going forward and then the senators and the president have discussions, uh, certainly in the blue slip process begins. Uh, there's conversations uh, in the Senate with the chair of the Judiciary Committee, with the home state senators, uh, about whether they will submit the blue slip. In other words, here's these candidates. Would you, would, would you be opposed to them? Uh, yes, no, maybe. One senator may say yes, one may say no. Uh, Normally, the um, senior senator and the one, that person who is in the uh, president's own party, sort of it's sort of understood that would have 
the prerogative in leading this sort of uh, developing list. Uh, it, it, is been, it has been found, of course, that uh, in the current administration, since it began uh, first term, uh, where there has been at least one, but certainly two uh, Republican senators that the um, blue slip process has not, um, has taken longer. Uh, and, but, but let's not, let's, let's not just focus on that. Um, there was in the beginning uh, a notion that uh, the administration uh, was overly cautious and waited too long to get just the perfect candidates so that we sort of built up a number of uh, vacancies that continued. So there was a mix of many things. But you recall the current, the current occupant of the White House came into office and said, I want to change politics. I want to get rid of the fighting. I want us to come together and collaborate. So that's sort of where everybody was moving. Um, the Bush White House, because it would not rely solely on the ABA, tended to try to reach out uh, more. The White House Council was asking all kinds of groups and individuals, uh, not that they weren't um, uh, clearly um, identified with a party, but, but was you know, aware of the politics of not uh, asking those on the other side of the fence for their views. Um, as you begin to develop this list behind the scenes, there comes a gelling around particular names, and then at some point the uh, White House gets the, the nod uh, that these folks are, would receive a blue slip, maybe not, maybe just from one senator, and uh, the, the Justice Department then begins what we call the vetting process. Many people fall out of that before they even get to the White House uh, vetting process of its own. And be, they just don't make it through. Uh, but that doesn't mean they don't make it the next time. The one thing to remember about behind the scenes, because you're dealing with um, the legislative branch, I always think it's all local. It's all local, which means that a national organization cannot push a particular nominee on a, on a state that does not want that nominee, that has a preference. And uh, those who wish to become judges ought to be very aware of the need to become what you might call superstars at the local level. Get, you know, get to be known at your bar level. Then the, the White House gets the list of those who have go, gone through the, the vet, and they begin to decide who's going to be nominated. All of this back and forth occurs. Uh, when the nomination is announced, then you hear support from groups, uh, you see opposition from groups, and it, you know it's going to the Senate, so people weigh in, national organizations weigh in, they have national organizations tend to have more resources than local organizations. They dig up things. And so after that, there's either a confirmation or not, or the, or the nomination becomes stalled. Let me just talk about, I, I think it's important if I could, um, um, two issues. First, it is not the case. It's more difficult, but it's not impossible for a nominee to come from a state where there are, uh, at least it's not been our experience of late, uh, a Republican and a Democratic senator. They're clearly split, um, but a nominee can get the blue slip. It takes some work, and normally it's done, at least in my view, best when it's behind the scene. Uh, I do a lot of um, vetting because the association does not um, support any candidate that has not been rigorously and separately vetted by our committee. But I do a lot of advising as well, and, and I'll ask the nominee, and the, you know, is this supposed to be a hard push? Do you want us to lay back? Uh, I ask the senators, do you want, you want us to lay back? 
And there's sometimes when the Senate will say, you know, we had a case where the Senator said, the Tea Party kind of likes me, so I don't want nothing to be, just don't, just leave me in the background, but I promise I will submit that blue slip. And did. After sort of time had gone by and there had been a chorus of uh, support for the nominee. Um, there are other times you just have to wait and other times where it doesn't work. Uh, where you have uh, a senator, a, a nominee where both senators are from the party, the party may not want that nominee, it may have someone else in mind. And it's not the case as well that the, the person who's best connected politically is the person that's selected because campaigns, de you develop a lot of friends politically when you run for office. So that's sort of the process and where it's broken down, where it broke down because I do think we've seen some thawing, okay? It's broken down where you have stalling. I don't think that's good for uh, the democracy in general. Uh, we have extensive vacancies in Texas and their, they've, their emergency um, uh, uh, courts and those vacancies should be filled and they're, they're very lengthy vacancies. That means it clearly is causing an impact on the delivery of legal services in that state. But anytime we have this number of vacancies, at one point every day it was 100 vacancies. We're now down to about 79, I think. Yes. 61. 61. Um, and, but, but that's still a lot when you think about what needs to be done to serve the population uh, in the way that the Constitution envisions. And with that, I will leave it. Okay, thank you. Now let me turn to uh, Professor Scott. I will mention on the, on the backlog and the vacancies, they impact very differently, I think, at the district court as opposed to the circuit right. court. At the circuit level, we really are not impacted that much by, by vacancies. There's thing, there are things that we can do. I can get on the phone, I can get somebody to come in to, come in to sit by designation. I've never had a problem with that. I usually have to say no to a lot of people. <laughs> Since I've been here, I've gotten three emails from judges wanting to sit in their circuit by designation. So we can fill our spots. But the district court at the trial level is a very different situation, and you've got the Speedy Trial Act to contend with. And I really think that's where the, there really is a real mm -hmm. problem. But Professor Scott, how, if at all, has the process changed over the past few decades or over time? Is this the way it's always been, or is what we're looking at now? We all, I think, associate everything today that's a problem as being an outgrowth of the Bork failed yes. nomination. But, but is that is true, or is it not true? But how has the process changed? Uh, the, uh the Bork example, the Bork and Thomas nominations were definitely inflection points in the judicial nomination uh, process. Uh, they're not the first highly contentious Supreme Court picks, of course. There have been a few others uh, in history, but it's the, the advent of the modern, very partisan, acrimonious kind of uh, selection process uh, that we've seen uh, since then. Uh, I'll talk generally about some of the forces that have led to the process that we're talking about today. Uh, longer delays, longer vacancies, more vacancies, uh, a sense of, of uh, greater partisanship and acrimony uh, creeping to more levels of the judiciary, whereas uh, the Supreme Court has long drawn a lot of uh, partisan, uh, intense partisan uh, activity. The courts of appeals uh, over the last couple of decades have become a battlegrounds as well. And in this administration, district court nominees have been more contested than we've seen in uh, in previous years, so it's it's creeping to the entire federal judiciary from what used to be a, a focus on uh, the very top of the federal judiciary. And I want to talk about uh, some of the forces that have uh, led us there and uh, and then offer a rather uh, pessimistic assessment of what we can do to uh, to fundamentally change that process. The major uh, overarching force is that the federal courts exercise critical power in our democracy, and so naturally, the political process is intensely interested in uh, affecting it in whatever way it can. Uh, not only does the Supreme Court obviously weigh in on matters of tremendous political importance, campaign finance and abortion, every contentious same-sex marriage lately has become uh, um, one of the major issues. It's uh, the federal courts wield enormous power on those issues, and so 
politicians on both sides of the aisle want to leave their imprint to the extent that they can. And there's increasing recognition that the courts of appeals and federal district courts also wield an enormous amount of importance. Lots of cases and issues never reach the US Supreme Court. Lots of topics where the US Supreme Court has weighed in, like uh, abortion laws and campaign finance laws, are left to the courts of appeals to resolve questions about whether particular state laws fall on this or that side of uh, a standard that's been set down by the Supreme Court. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the D.C. Circuit being sort of the, the second most contentious court uh, in the land because of the importance that everyone recognizes uh, that that, uh, that court influences, uh, the, the power that that court wields. Uh, so the, the, the basic point is the Supreme Court wields a whole lot of power, and so do the lower courts. As a consequence, the political process is highly engaged. Two other factors uh, that have complemented and, and really are responses to the degree of power that the federal courts wield. One is some structural changes in the Senate that have made it easier for, uh, for citizens and interest groups to get involved and thereby make the process more contentious. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, you may recall, senators weren't even directly elected. They, weren't, they were appointed by governors. Uh, so only for the last uh, hundred years or so have we had direct election and therefore a kind of direct citizen accountability for senators' votes on any issue, including uh, judicial nominations. Um, in addition, roll call votes on judicial nominees are a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, it was only in the middle of the 20th century that we started to get individual as opposed to voice votes, uh, roll call votes from senators on Supreme Court nominees. Uh, and until the mid-90s, roll call votes on uh, nominees to the lower courts were actually fairly rare. They're, they're commonplace now. That's not to say that plenty of nominees aren't still approved through a unanimous consent. Uh, but roll call votes, where you get to some indication of how individual senators voted and therefore accountability back home to how you cast a vote for a particular nominee. Uh, that's a, a fairly recent development in the grand scheme of things. And, uh, and that has obviously uh, made senators uh, think much more carefully and uh, therefore be much more susceptible to pressure uh, from uh, outside forces as to their votes. Um, and uh, the final force, and it's hard to understate this one, is the involvement of interest groups, both national and local interest groups in the nomination process. Interest groups play all sorts of important roles. Uh, most basically, they endorse or oppose uh, nominees, and sometimes that involves spending millions of dollars on television ads urging local senators to vote for or against a particular nominee. But interest groups play more subtle roles as well. Uh, we just heard Professor Robertson say uh, uh, that uh, interest groups will sometimes uh, do research, and, and they really are on the front lines. Senators and their staffs do not have to conduct opposition research, essentially, on the nominees put forward by other parties. Interest groups are doing that work for them. Uh, interest groups on, on both sides of every contentious issue will look very carefully into the records of people who've been nominated for a judicial office to see whether they see red flags. Uh, there's uh, one body of literature that talks about interest groups as pulling the fire alarm when they see uh, a nominee who seems to run afoul of their, uh, their preferred stance uh, on important issues. Uh, so that kind of research, bringing to the attention of senators who are uh, ideologically like-minded, concerns about nominees, that role has really fallen uh, to interest groups. In addition, interest groups, uh, they not only report their findings to uh, senators, but they'll report it to the press to try to get negative publicity about uh, uh, judges that they think are, are problematic, nominees they think are problematic. They'll also report it to grassroots groups and uh, local constituencies. And social media has really made this even more powerful. If you can whip up support on Twitter or Facebook or other social media against a nominee because of something in their past, that can become a powerful force to oppose a nominee that otherwise uh, might have flown under the radar uh, a, a decades earlier. Um, and we see this on both sides. Well, you, you mentioned uh, one judge who's now uh, being opposed. He's a no an Obama nominee, but being opposed by some interest groups on the left uh, who are concerned about his uh, record on, on uh, abortion. Uh, and so, uh, so Nayral is opposing an, an Obama nominee. That's unusual, but it's a, a good example of how interest groups uh, are, are uh, committed to their own issues and are willing to buck a president who's otherwise quite supportive of their agenda in order to take a stand on whether a particular nominee is acceptable and, and to urge senators to oppose the nomination and, and try to get someone else. As, as one of my favorite illustrations of this, uh, you know, interest groups will give these uh, ratings, a scorecard out of 100 points uh, every so often for, uh, for senators uh, to see whether they get a, a perfect rating from the National Rifle Association or a perfect rating from NARAL. Uh, 
interest groups increasingly will use votes on particular judicial nominees, even sometimes lower court nominees, as voting issues for these scores. So if you're a senator whose policy brand is, I'm supported by the NRA, and I, I want the NRA to support me, you will swallow hard before you cast the wrong kind of vote when the interest group that you depend on, that you, who's, on whose support you uh, have depended for years and who you want to be able to advertise in your next election campaign, a, a group that supports you, if they're telling you this is a high stakes vote we are watching closely and your score depends on the vote you cast, nobody wants to be the senator who votes the wrong way. So interest groups have really raised the stakes politically for, the, uh, for senators and uh, made it harder for uh, this kind of uh, history of deference to continue. It's become a, 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 the level of transparency for the judicial nominations process is much higher, uh, for better or worse. Um, I, I haven't mentioned a few other uh, trends that are sometimes discussed. Uh, one, just a sort of general partisanship, a, a, a growing divide between Democrats and Republicans, Republicans and Democrats in Congress, for example, both becoming more uh, extreme and polarized relative to previous generations. That's a potentially a factor. Um, sometimes you'll hear, uh, as another factor, presidents selecting more extreme nominees. Both sides tend to use this line when they're explaining why they're engaged in the current round of obstruction. Well, this president is nominating more extreme candidates than ever, and so we're just uh, responding. Uh, both Democrats and Republicans have said that over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the major forces are really structural, and they had to do with the power of the federal courts and the involvement uh, of interest groups. Uh, and the depressing thing about this is that none of those factors are going to change anytime soon. We are not going to see the federal courts abdicate the kind of power that they wield on uh, issues of great political salience. We're not going to see any kind of structural changes that make uh, the Senate's decisions about judicial nominees uh, less transparent, more invisible. Uh, uh, there's still plenty that happens behind the scenes, but uh, I don't think we're going to move toward, uh, uh, for example, vo all voice votes in the Senate so that uh, senators can uh, safely escape the consequences of their votes on, uh, on nominations. Nor are interest groups going to extract themselves from the process anytime soon. Interest groups uh, make a lot of money and do, in their view, I, I don't mean to suggest that interest groups are somehow nefarious. They're uh, working very hard on issues they care deeply about. That's not going to change anytime soon either. So uh, let me be the first to throw the wet blanket on the, uh, on the question posed by this panel. Is there a better way to appoint federal judges well, pretty much no, uh, that at least, it, and there's not a fundamentally better way to appoint federal judges. I think the best we can hope for are ways of tinkering around the edges with the way that the process works. The political forces that have led us to an acrimonious uh, uh, process of the kind that we have today are, uh, are, are very hard to change, and I don't expect they will change anytime soon. The best we can hope for, I think, are changes like the filibuster rule, which are, uh, are minor, uh, perhaps changes to blue slips and that sort of practice. But uh, I don't think we're going to see uh, any dramatic shift to uh, the, the days of the uh, Johnson and Kennedy administration, where the, uh, uh, the, uh, the expectation of deference was just fundamentally different. So I'll stop there with that uh, depressing assessment of okay, the uh, well. prospect for change. <laughs> Professor Lincoln, maybe you can lead us out of the doldrums of darkness. You've, you've done a lot of research in the area of possible alternatives and forgetting for a second the, the practicality of it, let's at least get onto the table some ways that you see some, uh, some changes possibly could be made to the current process and the consequences of if any of those changes for selecting judges. Well, to lead us out of the darkness, I think I first have to have at least a flashlight. I'm not sure that I do. <laughs> um, and actually, my views are pretty similar on, on this um, to uh, Ryan's. Um, uh, what, what can we do here? Um, and I'll, like, like Ryan, I'll, I'll try to cover a lot of ground uh, relatively quickly. Um, the first thing is senators have to do their job. I mean, that's basically it. They, the people who are nominated deserve a vote up or down, and this has been true from, uh, from when the obstructionism started, whenever you want to say it, it, it keeps getting at least slightly worse each time, um, uh, e e each additional president. Um, the nuclear option was either uh, right um, or, or, uh, when back it, when the, uh, when the uh, Bush administration, uh, during the Bush administration, senators wanted to get rid of it, or um, it was wrong. Um, and uh, I've been surprised, but well, not surprised. I've been disappointed, but not surprised to see the number of people who actually publicly weighed in against getting rid of the nuclear option during the Bush administration who now think it's uh, proper. I, I remember 
feeling ambivalent about it then and ambivalent about it now, but I, 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 since the system doesn't work, I think you have to make changes. And, and so I, I think getting rid of the, uh, of the filibuster on appointments um, uh, makes sense because, it's, um, uh, uh, because we're not able to solve the problem otherwise. Also, as Ryan mentioned, uh, I don't even under, even despite the lucid explanation of blue slipping, I still don't understand it. It makes no sense to me. It ought to be ended. I think it's a vestige of a, of a prior age. Um, one suggestion which I only make half seriously is change the style of judging. Perhaps if the judges followed the law a bit more and were not so, um, uh, not so willing to make law, uh, made law only when they had to, the stakes wouldn't be so high. But since the stakes are high, then I think it's pretty much unavoidable that we would uh, be able to get rid of this stuff. Um, term limits, which is one of the things that was mentioned here, I, I want to, in the setup for this, you know, we said, you know, should term limits be used for uh, lower courts? Absolutely not. Um, uh, the, the problem we have in lower courts is, is not, we have too many vacancies. Not, we don't need ways of creating more vacancies in the lower court. We have the problem is filling them as it is. Um, those of us who favor term limits for the Supreme Court, it's a, a different sort of thing. Um, I uh, did the numbers just this morning on the age of the court. Um, uh, there's four justices who are at least 75 years old. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 81. Antonin Scalia is uh, 78. Uh, Anthony Kennedy is going to be 78 in a, a short time, and Stephen Breyer is, is 75 and closer to uh, 76. Um, then the middle of the court is Clarence Thomas, who will be 66 on Monday, I think. Um, then um, uh, uh, Justice uh, Sotomayor, who's going to be, um, well, maybe it's, uh, one of them's on Monday and one's on Wednesday, but Sotomayor and Thomas. Um, uh, uh, so Alito is 64, uh, Sotomayor and Thomas are going to, uh, so Sotomayor is going to be 60, Roberts is 59, and Kagan is, so Justice Kagan is 54. Um, the, um, uh, Justices uh, since 1970 have been retiring at the age of 79. If you look at the average retirement age in the, uh, in the general public, um, it's about 62. And if you look at census data for, for people in their 70s, very few are working full time in their, in their, uh, their mid-70s by the time that really four justices uh, are up there. And some of it actually is energy. Um, I, the press reports have been uh, existing, but it hasn't hit the major newspapers, but um, Justice Ginsburg has appeared to fall asleep twice during, um, uh, during, uh, deliber during um, uh, um, uh, Supreme Court hearings. One was when a, an opinion was being read by a colleague, um, which of course I think is uh, quite forgivable. No, you know, uh, the, other, the other was actually during, <laughs> was actually, uh, you know, during, during argument. Um, and so there's just issues, even if someone's in a fully intellectually capable, they're just stamina issues which, uh, which uh, go to these things. I, I don't necessarily think that we should have a court that's always at its, the peak of its um, uh, performance, but um, you would hope that they would be not too far past those, uh, th those uh, uh, ages. Now the 18-year um, the, the term limit uh, proposals, basically you'd have a new, uh, a new appointment every odd year. Um, uh, is how it would work, and um, if the um, if this had been enforced, you know, there would have to be a phasing period. But if it had been enforced from the beginning, we'd have two Clinton appointees from his second term, which of course there weren't any, um, four Bush 43 appointees, not two, and we'd have three Obama appointees already. So there would be a five-four split. I don't think need to tell this audience what a difference that would make in results of, of the court if it was a 5-4 um, uh, Democratic split rather than a 5-4 Republican split. Um, now, strategic retirement, Rafe Stolzenberg, who's a quantitative sociologist at Chicago, where I got my, my PhD, um, uh, we did a paper together on uh, strategic retirement. Turns out that justices do strategically retire. It's no big surprise. But, um, uh, and they also are more likely to die in office when it, the opposing uh, president, because uh, they're waiting, hoping to strategically retire. Um, mental decrepitude's been a problem more often than you think on the court. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, and the, the, I, I, I want to say a little bit more about um, 
there was a suggestion, um, uh, Ryan was talking about polarization. I do a lot of work with the, uh, uh, with the public opinion data, and it's not just the, um, uh, the representatives who become more polarized. Uh, it used to be that most Democrats were not liberals. Um, now it's about, uh, about half our um, liberal Republicans used to be a non-trivial number. They're now virtually non-existent in the general public. Um, and um, I also wanted to mention something because it was sort of raised here about um, uh, uh, efforts of groups like National Bar Association and people like Frida. Um, I don't think people quite realize how um, ethnically diverse the uh, judges have become. So for example, I was looking at 2000 census data. So this is census data not reported from the judges, uh, from, the, uh, from the courts, and it's federal and state, um, so it's not. Uh, and basically, between ages of 31 and 65, 15% uh, of females um, who are uh, uh, employed report that, uh, I'm sorry, um, African American females are 15% of, uh, of uh, judges, um, of female judges. Um, and African American males are 5% of uh, male judges um, in that age group. That compares to about 4% uh, uh, lawyers in the, gen African American lawyers in the general public. So basically they are, um, especially for uh, African-American women, uh, a higher percentage of judges than the, uh, than the pool from which they'd be drawn. Um, okay, uh, so uh, essentially uh, I think that the, uh, the process of senior status works fairly well for, um, for retirement in the, um, in the Circuit Courts of Appeals. Um, it, it, hasn't, it, it did work in the 1930s. It was one of the things that uh, solved the uh, nine, nine old men um, issue. But every other time when the uh, court's gotten very old, um, actions have been taken. It went from, in the 1820s, they went from, um, from, uh, uh, from, um, from seven justices to nine in the late 1860s. They introduced pensions. Um, and then in the 1930s, they introduced senior status. And we're now at a sort of a similar situation in which, um, in which um, uh, it may make some sense to actually deal with this. Um, just for comparison, uh, in the era of leaving the court from 1789 to 1970, the average tenure was 15 years. The average age at leaving office was 68. Since 1970, the average tenure has been 26 years, and the age at leaving office has been 79 years. Thank you. On the diversity, I do want to mention, and I do want to try to get back to alternatives to where we currently are, although I'm sensing that folks seem to think there is no real viable alternative with the possible exception of term limits, but that goes not to picking judges, but to how to create more of a, I guess, a rolling selection of judges under the current system. And I, I think this is accurate. I've been, this is before I came on the bench, but I've heard many stories of how aggressively Jimmy Carter tried to diversify the bench in terms of getting females on the bench, and he had his attorney general actually making calls, I am told, into the leaders of bar associations around the country, basically saying, give me names of really solid females. He, he wanted one of binders full of women, huh? But <laughs> 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 or a school to John. Was <laughs> <laughs> John uh, the other said binders full of babies. <laughs> I did not say that. That is a quote from someone else who said that. <laughs> Purely in jest, mind you. Okay, I can. <laughs> but, <laughs> But that's why he was trying to get names to diversify the pool because at the time it was a, an all-male bastion. And our first female judge on our third circuit, is she's senior now, but Judge Slobler, uh is still participating in our decisions. And she was the first female on our court. And I'm yeah. sure that if I were to go around the country, if you would ask around the country, in most, if not all circuits, you'd find that the first female appointee is still either participating in the court or only recently has left. So the, the diversification there is very, very recent, uh, given the history of the country. Uh, Bill Clinton, who appointed me, in his first four years, appointed more African-American judges to the courts of appeals. I'm talking now just about the court of appeals. Mark. The district court may also be true. Then had been appointed by the two prior Republican um, presidents. And we're talking about two-term presidents. President Reagan served for two year, two terms. President Bush. Um, one is here for two years, so that's 16, I'm sorry, eight years, a total of 16 years. And President Clinton was able to do more, did do more in his first four years than those prior 16 years. So the diversity is a relatively new phenomenon. I don't think the clock can be turned back on that. 
Uh, in terms of the tenure, and I wanted to flesh that out more, if, if there were to be a way, and obviously it would take a constitutional amendment, to have a system of uh, either mandatory appointments or what's been talked about, and I think you've written about it, the Gordon Parachute concept, um, where it's made so attractive, in theory anyhow, the judges would find it very much to their advantage to retire after a certain uh, period of time, and I guess it could be tied in now to the period where most judges elect to go senior, and that is the age plus the term on the court equals 80 years, the rule of 80, what it's called. Maybe you could talk a little bit about those proposals. What concerns me, I guess, is that I'm not sure that that does anything to change the nature of the process or to reduce the contentiousness. Actually, it might ratchet up the contentiousness because you would know for any given president whether he or she would be uh, in a situation to appoint um, justices to the Supreme Court and just how many app appointments they get. And you could toss that out to anybody who wants to. Well, I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, part of the reason for raising term, term limits in the context of this was would it, would it reduce, um, uh, would it reduce uh, um, uh, the acrimony. And in the article where, um, uh, that I was involved in that advocated uh, term limits, we said that it probably would reduce acrimony for the reason that, um, that the stakes would be less. You'd only have um, someone on the court for 18 years rather than, than 26 or 30. Um, but it's absolutely possible uh, that it could go the other way because you know there'd be two during the first term, uh, during, uh, uh, during the term that you're voting for president. It could become a more major, it already is an issue in the election, but it could become a more major uh, issue. So I don't really think that would be a good reason to do it. I happen to think that logically the stakes would be lowered so it probably would reduce, but I certainly don't know that for a fact and I uh, agree that it could, could in fact cut the other way. I, I want to say one more thing about, uh, about um, uh, decrepitude. Uh, the Seventh Circuit has been experimenting a li little bit with um, voluntary um, testing for, uh, for aging judging, judges. Um, and so you go in and you do uh, two or three hours of tests, and they're the kind of things like, you know, how many animals starting with the letter C can you name in, in a minute or 30 seconds? You know, and you start thinking about that, and after you've thought about four or five, you're going, Oh my, oh my, you know, <laughs> can I think of any more? Um, uh, you know, is there something wrong with me? Or another test where they'll give a list of words, I don't know, five or 10 words, and then come back after 15 minutes and say, can, you know, can you remember those? Um, and so there's been a little bit of encouragement of that sort of thing. Um, uh, someone who had been chief judge uh, mentioned that he had gotten a call about a district court judge um, where some people were complaining that maybe he was losing it a bit and, they, um, uh, and the, uh, the chief judge asked his administrator, you know, is there a problem with this judge? And the administrator said, no, I haven't heard anything, but I'll look into it, you know. Um, looked into it and talked to some people who had argued before him recently and thought there might be a problem. He went in and, and um, suggested, didn't require the judge to, uh, to have this uh, evaluation done, didn't ask for the results or anything, but several weeks later the judge uh, retired. Or, uh, or took three weeks at home, which I, in this case, probably retired, actually. Um, so I think encouraging that sort of thing is a probably a good idea. I don't think people are always the best judges of their uh, current um, uh, mental state. I certainly am um, uh, less quick than I was uh, when I was in my 20s, and, um, and um, uh, you know, I've certainly debated whether to, to go in and do sort of a baseline to try to get this done. But I think encouraging a culture that does that, I think, would be good for uh, weeding out some people who have, who have problems um, um, uh, in, as they age. The, sure, go ahead. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, all all, all uh, district circuit and Supreme Court justices are eligible for senior status, has been stated. Once you become 65 and you've served 15 years, uh, you can basically leave active status, but, but, still, but still say active. Uh, that's much less true in the Supreme Court. About, about half the federal judges serving now are in senior status. It's quite a high mm -hmm. number because those judges if, know that if they want, they can still sit on their court or on other courts. You can't do that on the Supreme Court, so the incentive to stay on seems to me is probably much, much stronger, and I don't see any solution to that. Senator Leahy proposed a bill that when there was a, a, a recusal of a justice, a retired justice might step in, but that was greeted with, you know, a, Justice Scalia thought it was just a terrible idea, um, for whatever that's worth. 
So, so, so you have that, that dynamic. A Supreme Court justice retires and can sit on the Court of Appeals, but it's kind of a letdown, and you could get reversed by your colleagues also. <laughs> and that actually did happen with Chief Justice Rehnquist, who sat on one of the circuits, I believe, the uh, District Court, to, to get some trial experience, and he was reversed by the circuit. Um, the, the, the blue slip seems to be what's driving a lot of tonight. I will back up for a second. When I was in the process of my own nomination, I happened to have a, an incredibly memorable and wonderful discussion, totally by happenstance, with one of the then leaders of the Senate, incredibly powerful on the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, and he, he we, we struck up a wonderful relationship. In fact, he started referring to me as his homie because he thought I was from his hometown, and I wasn't, <laughs> but I wasn't going to tell him that. But, <laughs> but we had about an hour conversation in the quad of the Senate where he explained to me exactly how it works, and he basically said, forget what you learned about common law. That has not very little to do with the way federal judges are selected, that, and we haven't heard too much about this. I think they get lost in the process. That district judges are picked by the senators that the president cannot appoint someone unless the United States senators, both of them, sign off on the selection. The president has the authority of saying, I don't want that person when a name comes over and send it back. Or the president can ask the senator um, for a name. But the way it was explained to me, the district court judges have to come out of the senators. At the circuit level, it varies very much from president to president. When I was doing this president, Clinton pretty much did it out of the office of White House counsel. Uh, there was a guy there who was working with um, Bernie Nussbaum, who was really my main contact and who was shepherding this. I tend to think, from what I can tell, and Professor Robinson, you know better than me, that President Obama does the same thing. Some of the presidents, I think President Reagan did this out of the Justice Department. Um, this, this really not the same kind of institutionalized practice or custom when it comes to, to circuit judges. But is there any way do you think that, realistically speaking, and I had a conversation with someone incredibly powerful, uh, it, who knows this process well, shortly after the filibuster was abolished, who told me that very creative minds, to use his term, were working on doing away with the blue slip process. And he was very optimistic the blue slip would be done away with because he was telling me how happy he was that the filibuster had been ended. And I said, I don't think it'll matter much to anybody outside of the District of Columbia <laughs> because of the blue slip problem. But is there a way, and I'll talk if anybody wants to answer it, to change the blue slip process, and if the blue slip process was changed, would that be a better way than trying to get term limits or something of that sort to reform how judges are selected? Uh, I, I am, let, let me just uh, interject my view. Uh, I disagree that, that uh, uh, somehow in this, this environment, the blue slips are going to go away. That's the power of that particular senator. I mean, the senator has a, enormous power uh, by holding that blue slip where uh, the, the president has said, I'm going to respect the blue slip. Now, if, if a president said, well, you know, you can send it or you're not, it really doesn't matter, um, or signals nothing, um, the current president indicated from the beginning that he wanted to work with the home senators. Uh, and he stayed true to that. Uh, the, the Boggs nomination, uh, as, as you've heard, has become a very troubled one. Uh, the opposition is intense. And, uh, you know, that was the deal that, that was struck. Now, if we were to do away with the blue slip process, what then would be the power of a home senator uh, to either advance or block a nominee, and then why would that senator therefore agree to eliminate blue slips, and I'm just throwing this out for conversation, agree to eliminate the power that that, that senator has? What, what, was the, what was the thinking uh, on why a senator would do that? Most of them don't want to lose any power, right? So. Why, why would that occur in, in a real sense, a political sense? I don't have an answer to it, uh, so I'm surprised that someone thought that there was a real possibility. It would be great. Um, I don't know. Well, I don't either, and I, and I was skeptical. I did not tell him I was skeptical uh, because he knows this thing a lot better than I do, but I was skeptical because as uh, 
Professor Wheeler and I were chatting before this started, it's to every senator's advantage to maintain the blue slip. Even Absolutely. in a given case, that own senator's choice for um, a judgeship may not get off the ground. Uh, and, and even before the blue slip formally was instituted, the senators would, would, would do the same thing. They would stand on the floor of the Senate and say, this, uh, this uh, nominee is, use the phrase, personally obnoxious to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now it's a little tamer. They, they, they don't return the blue slip. The best example of that, by the way, is uh, a district judge who was nominated in Nevada, Harry Weed's choice. Uh, Senator Heller came into office after his predecessor had to resign and was told by the NRA that they shouldn't support her because of her answer to a questionnaire about gun rights. And Senator Reid couldn't even get a hearing. So that tells you how powerful it is. But I think, I think uh, Alfred is absolutely right. It's, in, it's ingrained in the Senate that we're going to protect our own. And I, I'm, I'm going to defer to Senator Heller because I sure as heck want Senator Heller to defer to me when I'm, uh, there's patronage involved in my state. And, and you think that would continue even if, uh, because you didn't have uh, Senator Leahy, who is, uh, uh, has supported the Blue Slip process, or a president like President Obama, who's a former senator himself and has a kind of commitment to those institutional norms. Even if those two folks had a different view, you think that something like the Blue Slip process would continue just as a matter of senatorial courtesy? I, I don't, uh, you know, it's courtesy, but it's also power. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. the power to control who becomes a judge in your particular state, in, in, in at least that which you can control. So I don't know why, in a political sense, anyone would do that, because at least with respect to that state, they would have that power. And it's true, Senator Leahy has always been, um, you know, one who thought that the tradition of the tra traditions of the Senate should be maintained, all the rules, all the order. Uh, and uh, to, you know, to some, uh, you know, just maybe too much so. But he has been that rock solid uh, senator when many of the others in the Senate, so there's been turnover who, who aren't adhering to those traditions. So I'm, I'm not sure that it would change, uh, particularly since now so many of those who come into the Senate are what they call of the new breed. They are, they are uh, those who don't necessarily want to be aligned with the um, traditions of Washington, but rather have promised their constituents that they're going to be rather independent. So I'm not sure that that um, that that a change of how the White House does it or um, the particular uh, chairman or chairwoman of the Senate uh, would make a difference. But I I do believe that. Um, we have a problem, obviously. It's a tremendous problem. Now, now let, me, let, let me just say this. I, I think it has become more difficult. We don't have to go into the reasons uh, why everything has become more difficult since uh, President Obama was elected. We don't have to, it's beyond the scope here. And we're in a nice audience, so I won't <laughs> say so. Why? But everything has become more difficult. And there's a hard edge. You refer to it as you know, somewhat more partisan. There is a hard edge to some folks in the Senate. Let's just realize it. It is what it is. And working through that, I do think there's been a softening. I think sort of people have come to a realization um, he's been reelected, so at least, you know, there's that term left. However, I believe that once we get closer to November, as everyone figures out there might be a change, that we're going to see some certainly um, uh, sort of a, a, a let's see, let's wait and see, let's wait and see, let's wait and see. And if the Senate majority party changes, I think we're going to see a very different process. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. It is the reality of the politics now. And the blue slip, while it is in place, uh, could result in a president in the White House unable to achieve uh, filling vacancies as they grow. 
and okay, so we have less. So we now have 60 something. Well, the judges are retiring, right? They've done their part. And, and so now we're gonna have ret more retirements. There are vacancies that haven't been announced that have come to my attention where they're basically saying, I'm done, I'm tired, find, find some young folks. Well, let's add this, this to the mix. Fewer people want to go for a nomination because the process is so ugly. Because you can't just be a superstar. You have to be a superstar and blameless. You have to have no spots, no wrinkles. You have to have basically done nothing in college that every college student does. <laughs> nothing. We're not talking about big stuff. We're talking about the little stuff. You're talking about inhaling. I'm not even talking about that. Drinking in the dorm. You know, you're 19 and you're in a state where you're supposed to be 21. Those kind of things. People just don't want to go through that process. They also don't want to spend two years waiting to be confirmed. Because if they're in a law firm, they lose money and they lose clients. If they're um, a, a federal prosecutor or a state prosecutor, they really have to stay away from all kinds of cases. It's just a very difficult place to be. And you have to be extraordinarily strong not to, you know, to be able to withstand the picking on the internet, you know, all the social media, which years ago, Judge, you didn't have. Uh, and so I think this is, this is just a different time. And I'm not sure that uh, we're going to see a big change soon. I'm praying that I'm the optimist, right? It's like, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, an historical note. Um, yeah, uh, historical note, the, um, the, there have been uh, times in the past where patronage has been lessened. Uh, Ray Solomon has a, 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 did an, uh, an article on the um, appointment of Circuit Court of Appeals judges uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And um, uh, Wilson, right from the beginning, knew that he didn't want to go with Senate patronage he wanted a political animal that would be uh, favorable to what he wanted to do with the federal government. Uh, uh, Hardy and Coolidge, on the other hand, went for the sort of the patronage senatorial model. Uh, throughout their uh, presidencies, you know, they're looking at lions of the bar, not people who necessarily have a strong political com commitment. And then both of the Roosevelts, they started out picking lions of the bar, and then they suddenly realized, hey, this isn't working. Uh, I need some people in there that are going to do what I want want done to, to, to get their agendas going. So then they switched over to the political model. So we have seen other attacks on uh, senatorial uh, um, uh, patronage models uh, that have worked in the past. I think it can work. It may take a long time, but I think Bruce Lipping is probably a bad idea. We do have a question. Yes, sir, I do want to hear from you. Oh, oh, going to the audience. Is there a question? Yes, sir. Um, maybe a, is the microphone? We can hear you, but I think for and purposes of recording. Would you uh, introduce yourself to? Oh, uh, Victor Williams uh, from uh, uh, DisruptiveJustice.org and Catholic University. Um, th there is a better way. It, it's the, the recess appointment method. Um, uh, 300 judges have come to the bench. Uh, four of the first African-American judges um, uh, were recess appointees. The first uh, Jewish uh, federal judges were recess appointees. Uh, uh, two of the first uh, female judges were recess appointees. You say, oh, well, no canning. <laughs> That's I'm exactly. Sorry to say, I didn't hear uh, 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 one might respond, "Oh, but what about Noel Canning?" Oh. And, we, and we have to say, "Well, um, uh, you know, our good friend Amy Hallett, Scotus Blog, is still uh, waiting for that. We're all waiting for Noel Canning." The reason we should not get an answer from the Supreme Court in Noel Canning is this very reason: um, that a recess appointment of judges makes that uh, 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 challenge a political question. Uh, the, the court should not give us an answer. The court should not interfere with the president's uh, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 3, uh, unilateral authority. Um, so this is the better method, um, a recess appointment. Obviously, you obliterate uh, the blue slip business uh, at least for a couple of years. Uh, it worked with Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was still put through hell uh, for his confirmation, but wearing those black robes um, um, uh, certainly, uh, certainly helped. Uh, do you want to say something else? Not if people have, have yeah, questions. Yeah, we're, we're into the question area now. Uh, how many questions? Let me just general feeling. Does anybody have any questions? If not, we'll yeah, keep going. Good, good point. Uh, 
I'm James Plug. I'm a long time in the past a Senate staffer on the Judiciary Committee, and now at American University as an adjunct professor. Um, you and I were on a panel uh, in Philadelphia uh, a couple of years ago. Maybe I should be asked how many annals begin with C because I can't. I can't remember the panel. <laughs> <laughs> At the Constitution Center. Oh, okay, I got you. And it was okay. a day that Arlen right. Specter was there, too. I don't think he was on our panel, he but he, he was wasn't. there. But shortly before that event, he expressed Byer's remorse, I believe, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, about Judge Ali Justice Alito. Yeah. And of course, Justice Alito, it may have been mentioned before I got it here in the room, uh, there was a cloture vote, and enough senators voted against him on the final vote so that if they had voted against cloture, he would not be on the court. And then Senator Specter uh, had his own buyer's remorse, and I assume some of those 44 senators had buyer's remorse. What do we learn from that whole experience? Uh, do you think Senator Specter would have been happy, happier when he went to his, de his uh, deathbed if he hadn't signed that blue slip? Uh, I think the answer is it didn't make any difference because he also made the confirmation happy. But can we learn anything from that whole experience? I just want to, I won't get too much into that, but there were some very strong personal relationships behind the scenes there that accounted in large part for what the senator did. He, he was, some, and you probably know who I'm referring to. Um, but that, and that, I did not know the senator's back all that well. I did know very well the person that I'm referring to was very close to him, but was was a very large influence in how he, he took that vote and what ended up happening with it. Anybody else want to comment on that? Sir, you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, I'm curious. Uh, my name's Andy Green. I work here in Washington um, in the Senate. And um, I'm curious if you can share some perspective on what role state level judicial elections and the politicization of the courts, campaign finance at the state level, uh, plays a role in this process? Yeah, I, I, and I'll try to op open, but I, mm -hmm. before I came on the Third Circuit, I was a state judge, and in Pennsylvania, we elect our judges at all levels, so I ran for election. And I have to tell you that anybody who advocates serious, well, let me rephrase this. Right now, as I think about the reasons for electing judges, I can't think of a reason that would support electing judges that would be consistent with sanity uh, it's an abomination of a process. It's an uh, it's a uh, adulteration of the process. It's a prostitutionalization of the process, and it makes absolutely no sense. And I don't care how you structure it. Whether you structure it like they have in Pennsylvania, where you're elected for a set term of ten years and then you run for a quote bipartisan retention vote. Uh, when, uh, just one quick example: when I ran for retention after my ten-year term. The usual folks came out of the woodwork and you know the ward leaders and committee people. We have a tradition in Philly where the Democrats have a very large dinner each uh, campaign year and the Republicans have a large dinner each campaign year and candidates for office are expected to buy a table. And of course, it's only an expectation, uh, but if you don't do it, there's, you don't get elected basically. There's no one supports you. <coughs> and uh, I was called, by, and, and Philadelphia is a one party town. A Republican cannot get elected for anything in Philadelphia unless written into our home rule charter it provides specifically for one Republican member of that office, and there are a couple that do provide that. So basically, people, when they ran, would take care of the Democratic ward leaders, and when I say take care, and that's a long story, you pay your street money, um, and not buy tickets to the Republican dinner. When you run for the general election, you, it was expected you'd buy a table at the Democratic dinner and the table at the Republican dinner, because if you don't do that, you tick off everybody, and, and that you don't want to do. But when you run for retention, uh, the same expectation was there. And I went to someone I respected, who was the administrative judge in the division I was assigned to, and I told them, you know, I'm getting approached by the Republican City Committee about buying a table. To me, it does not make an awful lot of sense. And he said, Ted, no matter what you do, two thirds of the people who bother to vote in the re retention election, and, and, and there's a big drop off as you know as you go down the ballot. Two-thirds of the people who get down to where the retention judges are will vote to retain you. A third of the people who go down that far will vote not to retain you, no matter what you do. So I said, if you want to put $5,000 into the Republican City Committee's chambers by buying a uh, coffers by buying a table, go ahead. 
But he said it makes no sense. So I did. I didn't buy a table. All the judges who were running with me from retention, I think they were loving us that year, went out and bought tic- tables and they thought I was crazy. But when the returns came in, I got 66% yes and 33% no. <laughs> the same as those folks who were given all the money to the Republican Party. Uh, so even under, even that structuring where you run in a contested election and then have a so-called bipartisan retention election, it just makes no sense. The, 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 you don't know who the people are who are running for judge. You can't know. I don't know now when I vote for judges who are who the judicial candidates are because they've been out of the state system for so long. If there's a lawyer I know and he's back to his running, I'll vote for him. Otherwise, I just won't exercise my full number of votes for that position. It, it, it makes no sense. Can I uh, jump in on this too? I, one other change that uh, the experience of state judicial elections has had for uh, Jim and I uh, write a lot on uh, uh, proposed reforms to the Supreme Court. And one change that that has had is uh, 10, 20 years ago, you were seeing a lot more people vigorously advocating for elections of Supreme Court justices, federal court uh, elections. And those calls have really subsided. That's, uh, not very many people are seriously advancing. And I think that's a product of uh, dissatisfaction and horror in some cases at the way uh, state level judicial campaigns are run. I, we had a couple other really great questions that we didn't have a good answer to right away. I'll do my best to, to, to say something about recess appointments as an alternative model. Um, it's uh, politically risky because it's unpopular to, uh, to sidestep the Senate. Um, and there are also some serious constitutional concerns. You're right that uh, some of these cases might not end up being justiciable by the federal courts who are considering them. But that doesn't mean that the constitutional problem isn't there. And there are serious constitutional questions raised about so the circumstances in which a resource appointment happens, the, the kind of break that's sufficient and that sort of thing. So it's a riskier strategy. And there's a reason that uh, uh, no president has used it as a matter of course. Uh, it's uh, always in exceptional circumstances that uh, presidents have elected to use the recess appointment power. A few times for Supreme Court justices, but uh, uh, a very small percentage of federal judges initially got their positions through recess appointment. And I, I don't expect that will change because of these political and constitutional concerns. And, and the Senate is doing its level best to uh, make that impossible by uh, uh, continuing in permanent session uh, as needed. Yeah, how, can, yeah, I, can, I can I just can, can I say one thing? As a matter of fact, if you go back to the early 20th century, recess appointments of judges were quite was fairly common. I've gone back and looked at it. And the reason was the president would make a recess appointment knowing full well when he submitted the nomination to the Senate, this person would be confirmed in maybe 10 or 11 days. And so there was no qualms about making recess appointments because confirmation was virtually guaranteed. Hmm. Now it's very different. I mean, I think the last recess appointment of a judge was Pickering, who didn't get reappointed because he engendered so much opposition. So it's a, it's a risky business anymore. What, what, I, I, I wanted to comment to uh, one of the things that, that, that it's worth thinking about here is how independent a judiciary do we want? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the one of the things that people sort of uh, don't realize is we could have an even more independent judiciary if they chose their own successors. So you uh, you know we have uh, 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 charitable boards that choose their own successors. Uh, why not the Supreme Court choosing its own successors? Well, when you start to think about that, you start thinking, well, okay, so some democratic input is probably a good thing here. We probably (laughs) don't want them choosing their own successors. So appointed in a recess appointment is the next step down, and then appointed with consent of the Senate is the next step down, then nonpartisan uh, or bipartisan elections the next step down, and then full partisan elections uh, uh, at, at the bottom. So it is a question of where you're going to draw the line. And I, I, I think almost all of us will draw the line to exclude um, self-perpetuating uh, courts. Um, uh, some of us will draw the line um, uh, to, to, to allow recess appointments. Some wouldn't um, uh, um, in this kind of uh, independence. A couple questions here. Sorry if you go all the way back. But well, you, you've got the microphone. Go ahead. So I'll get to you next. Um, I'm Kyle Berry with Alliance for Justice. Um, uh, I have a question for, I guess, those who think that blue slip reform would be essentially useless, you know, given its relatively informal nature. It's not necessarily an all or nothing proposition. You know, the chairman could hold a hearing, but not a committee vote um, without a blue slip, or there are cases where you have um, senators approving of a nominee informally ahead of a nomination and then withholding a blue slip where you might say, well, clearly there's been consultation here, so in this particular case, we'll hold a hearing, and we had that with Marco Rubio and a nominee in the Southern District of Florida. It's happening now in North Carolina um, with Jennifer May Parker. So I'm wondering, 
if uh, you know you have thoughts on the efficacy of those sort of, sort of more modest reforms to the blue slip tradition. Well, let me just say about um, Alliance for Justice maintains, and this is just an aside, the best stats daily on the judiciary. They I just agree. do. I agree. Daily, <laughs> hourly. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the notion of, I want to go back to your point, the notion of sort of the judges picking, and I've heard of that, you know, recommendation, the judges can kind of pick their own, you know, they're just their successors. Well, we know what the judiciary would look like. It wouldn't look like this, correct? Because we'd start with it looking like before. So that, I, I'm not as troubled by the blue slip process. It's, it's annoying, but we can work with it. Uh, I, I worked with Rubio's office and Rubio on a successful nomination. You know, it took a while. We had to have several discussions and um, sort of the local politics had to weigh in, but, but it happened. So I, I suppose there's a mix that comes in because it's not formalized and you sort of, as you know, you continue to um, work on that nomination or not nomination, however you want to do it, and some organizations can work um, uh, you know, to um, suggest nominees, some can't, you know, some work on the district court level, some work on all levels, some work on the Court of Appeals and Supremes. So, so my mine would be, I, I don't know what the alter better alternative is. I, I guess within the universe that I see as the universe for now, uh, maybe five, 10 years. Let me go back to the last the question. Lines for the Justice, by the way, under this administration has been very effective and when I was involved uh, were very, very helpful, quietly helpful, because at the time I would have made more enemies than friends had you come on publicly <laughs> for me. But this <laughs> question back there. Hi, my name is John Heineman. I just graduated UT Austin. So the panel's mentioned how long it takes to get nominations confirmed and certainly there's a uh, risk there. A good example is Goodwin Liu. Uh, was, it was taking too long to get confirmed for the Ninth Circuit. So I went to the Supreme Court of California. However, well, it wasn't and, quite that easy. <laughs> well, sure, it wasn't it that easy. Like it was his option. But <laughs> an analog in my mind is when people talk about speeding up how long it takes to build a nuclear power plant, that's a very important thing with very serious ramifications. Do you really want to speed that up? So two years is certainly too long, but is there a value in the nomination process being difficult? And on the converse, is there a danger in making it too quick and allowing um, candidates who may not be the absolute best to get a position on the federal bench. Don't, don't e equate efficiency with um, speed. I mean, the, the reason why it's long now does not necessarily mean that it's a qualitative protraction of, of the process. One person I, whom I know of uh, filled out her questionnaire very, very honestly. In the, we're all given questionnaires and we're nominated. She was asked, one of the questions was whether or not she had ever uh, used a controlled substance. And I think it's worded, and you would know probably better than me because you've seen her questionnaire more recently. It may have been since becoming a member of the bar or since being an adult, something like that. But anyhow, she put down yes. And she came in afterwards and she spoke to me about it because it totally blew her out of the water. One senator made it publicly known, I think, he would not support anybody who had said that they had smoked marijuana. She had done, she had smoked marijuana at a neighbor's house 15 years ago at a pool party. The neighbor had the marijuana, the smoking marijuana, offered her a puff on the marijuana cigarette. She took it and handed it back. That was it. She truthfully answered the questionnaire because you're under penalty of perjury, and that caused her to be eliminated. The, the Philadelphia Bar Association was solidly behind her. The, uh, her firm was solidly behind her. She had an incredibly stellar reputation in the bar. She practiced before us many times. We'd appointed her as an amicus uh, several times in our cases. This was a very fine and capable uh, appellate lawyer who did probably something which 90% of the adults her age had done, if not 99.5%. And she was honest about it. That kind of thing is the kind of thing that I'm concerned about and I think others are concerned about. Th there has to be a realistic application of, of standards. 
and one person's pet peeve about what is moral and what is immoral ought not to be able to come in via a blue slip process to blow a perfectly fine and decent person out of a consideration for, for a judgeship. That's my concern with the, with the blue slip problem. It, it really does empower uh, <coughs> senators. And this was not a home state senator that did this. Any other questions at all? Just one comment. Uh, Sir. And Professor Scott Miller suggested, I think, too, this is constitutional. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for your time. I do want to just quickly mention that I just Googled this morning my, my, the great alternative to Westlaw uh, to find out how new the process is with Supreme Court justices not getting nom Supreme Court nominations not getting confirmed. And I'm sure that the academicians here know this much better than I do. But um, according to what I was able to find out, it started back with President Washington who did not get three nominations to the Supreme mm. Court. One was withdrawn, I think two actually defeated. The other presidents who have not gotten, who have gotten their nominations to the Supreme Court defeated, Ulysses Madison, Ulysses John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, okay. Ulysses Grant. Um, so as much as the you climate may have changed, the structure of the process of getting nominations through has not necessarily changed. I think these are all for very different reasons than we might tell them now, but it's not new. Uh, actually, some of them weren't that different. Uh, during the first Whig president, um, the Senate, which was strongly uh, uh, still Democratic, just absolutely refused to to uh, to uh, 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 allow any Whig to be uh, to be put on the Supreme Court, and uh, the president finally uh, decided to appoint a, uh, a Democrat. Because, who was the president then? Uh, who, who was the president in 1840? Um, Polk, wasn't it? Uh, what? Polk. Polk. Uh, it was uh, Polk Tyler. Was Tyler. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, one of the last thing in closing, but thank you for your attention. It's a Saturday morning. And we all appreciate your giving us your time. Yes, One thank thing you. that always strikes me is that, and this started, I think, and, it, and I don't want to make this sound as though it's ideological, but I will mention by way of example, the, the events I've been to for the Federalist Society, there seems to be a very firm awareness that people need to think about going on the bench. And I just want to make sure that at people of quality and excellence, no matter what your ideological uh, leanings are. Think about going on the bench. If you're liberal or progressive, you ought not to necessarily take yourself out of the equation because you think you can't get mm -hmm. confirmed. You may have defended the local ACLU in a suit. Uh, the times change, and we're talking about uh, a time span where you don't really know what the politics will be like five or 10 years down the road from now. You can't build your practice in a way to maximize getting to the court because it's like trying to plan your subway according to where lightning is going to strike next. But uh, I would hope that if it's something that appeals to you, you would not take yourself out of the equation of, of going on either a federal or a state, uh, a state bench, because we really do need to have ideologically people, as I said, all from the entire ideological spectrum uh, in the pool of prospective candidates that presidents can select from in, in picking judges. Thank you. I agree. Thank you.